Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. So when a patient sits down with me to talk about surgery, there are really three major options. You know, you can do nothing at all. Um, if a patient is very elderly and not in good shape, um, and you can almost make the diagnosis these days radiographically, some very elderly patients in poor prognosis decide to just go hospice once that, once that radiographic tentative diagnosis is made. But most commonly, we look at deciding whether we're going to do a needle biopsy, versus a resection. And if we do a resection, or removal of that tumor, our goal is always to get as much as we can safely out without leaving the patient with a neurologic deficit. Um, biopsy tends to be reserved these days for patients with deep-seated tumors or tumors in whom radiographically you don't have a very good idea of what's going on. Um, I used to do a lot more biopsies earlier in my career, but with advances in, in uh, MR and radiography, we can tell probably 90 to 95 percent of the time that a patient has a, a glioblastoma versus a metastasis versus a lymphoma, other brain tumors that can commonly mimic uh, glioblastoma, you know, in the neighborhood of three quarters to four fifths of the time. So it's those rare cases where there's some diagnostic uh, dilemma about this or a deep-seated tumor that usually get the biopsies first. If a biopsy is done and it does prove that it's a glioblastoma and it is an area that is resectable, or we have a pretty good idea going into this that we're dealing with a glioblastoma just from the MRI, then we focus on the discussion of how much of the tumor can we safely get out. These days we use a lot of adjuncts in surgery to help get tumors out safely, most commonly using what's called stereotactic navigation, which is a way in which we use a uh, MRI and, and often either fiducials on the patient's head, which are little uh, markers to tell us where parts of the head are so that we can register or make sort of a GPS map of the patient's head that we use for surgery. And we use a little light pen during surgery to tell us where the edges of the tumor are. So we use that in combination with intraoperative ultrasound or other intraoperative imaging. Some places use intraoperative MRI, although we use ultrasound most of the time at Geisinger. And then the last adjunct to help us out with our surgical resection is one that I rely upon fairly heavily called neurophysiology, electrical stimulation of the brain itself or pathways in the brain to try and make sure that we are doing a safe resection during surgery. In the old days, I used to do many of these operations awake. Now I can do just about any surgery near motor activity of the brain asleep simply by mapping out the surface of the brain electrically using something called motor evoke potentials, as well as stimulating the white matter underneath the cortex of the brain with a stimulator during surgery to try and stimulate those white matter pathways to tell me when I'm getting close to the descending motor tracks that help control the movement of the arms and legs. In the past, I used to have to do this awake and just uh, monitor the patient neurologically, but now we've been able to do this very consistently over the last 10 to 15 years. And patients that early in my career were, that had tumors in or near motor areas that I would do awake, I can do asleep quite effectively. I still do awake operations uh, a few dozen times a year, mostly for tumors in or near speech areas, which are, we still find difficult to map out while a patient is asleep. We can use radio, radiologic adjuncts such as functional MRI and diffusion tensor imaging, which maps the little white matter pathways in the brain to give us an idea of where these speech pathways are, um, but we have no way to monitor them in real time in, during the operation. And during the operation, when you're working on the brain, the brain's about the consistency of a bowl of jello. And if you think of the tumor as being a piece of fruit embedded in that bowl of jello, once you make the incision or cut in that jello, the jello shifts a little bit. So the mapping or GPS system that you made may not be entirely accurate. So when I have a patient with a tumor near speech areas, especially near expressive speech areas, I like to have that patient awake. We stimulate the surface of the brain to find out exactly where those speech areas are, how they relate to the map we have of the tumor, and then while we're taking the tumor out, continually monitor the patient with a neurologist, talking to the patient under the drapes, doing uh, speech testing and language testing to make sure I'm not doing anything that's interrupting with, with, uh, with that patient's speech. And when we do that, we have a very low 
uh, morbidity. We often cause some temporary worsening of the speech in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 percent of the time, but only about one or two percent of the time do we have an injury that leaves the patient with a permanent deficit. And as we mentioned earlier, avoiding a permanent deficit is the most important part of the brain tumor surgery aside from getting as much of that tumor out as possible because if we hurt that patient they're not going to do as well in the long run. Now the same discussion occurs with the patients whether they're 10 years old or 90 years old. Obviously we've got you know, different ability to recover in an older patient versus a younger patient. You know, we may have differences in their overall survival but it's that same balance of the risk of surgery and trying to get as much as we can versus the patient's recovery ability and what their goals and desires are in life to figure out the best path and the most accurate complete resection we can for each patient before we move on to the next stages of therapy which of course include the radiation and drug therapy. Now one of my partners, Dr. Nick Marco, a couple of years ago did a beautiful paper in the Journal of Clinical Oncology which showed mathematically how percent of resection varies with outcome. And essentially what that model showed is that there's not a single cutoff like we used to think 10 or 20 years ago that you had to get 98 or 85 percent of the tumor out and the patient magically was transported to a better prognostic group. In fact, there's a curve that's almost a logarithmic shaped curve with a greater percent resection, the greater the prognosis. And that varies both with age and Karnofsky performance level as well as percent resection. So that a young patient in a good Karnofsky performance group does even better with a greater percent resection than an elderly patient who's not doing as well. And what this leads to is a discussion with the patient really, really focusing on quality of life and percent of resection before the surgery begins. If we do anything that causes a neurologic deficit during surgery, the patient's uh, overall survival and of course their quality of life bottoms out and they do not do very well overall. So our goal surgically is to do the maximum safe resection, to get as much of that tumor out as possible. Um, it's the goal of my team to almost always get an imaging complete resection or a gross total resection it's sometimes called where we can't see any visible tumor left on the MRI. And that does put the patient in a better prognostic category than half the tumor out or a biopsy alone, of course. 